Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia, and with me tonight is Father Patrick. How are we doing, Father Patrick? I'm well, thank you. Is this, the mid hmm? is this the midnight watch over there? Almost. It's only 11 um, p.m. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so it's. I'm very pleased to have you on tonight because this is something, the topic of Hilly Poitier and his pneumatology has been something that we've been talking about for about a year. Uh, and it's a topic that we both find mutually interesting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, neither of us are specifically experts in Hillary Poitier specifically, but we're interested people who like Hillary Poitier. Would I, would I say that's the case? Yeah, yes, yes. Now he's one of my favorite Western fathers. Um, so I in, enjoy reading him. I, I take him as a, quite a solid authority on, on the Orthodox faith. And um, yeah, no, I, I, I much appreciate reading him. So. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not, not a sort of, I don't know him as well as Chrysostom and some of the other Eastern fathers, but I, I have read through him and I, I, I enjoy what I've read. It's. Uh... Well, one of our viewers just said, I need to leave for bed. Good luck. So he went on to say good luck to you before he goes to sleep. So hang in there for us and don't go to sleep yourself. You got your bed behind you. And uh, what I'm going to do is first talk about why this topic is of general interest to Orthodox Christians, which is generally there's this sort of misnomer that the Eastern saints were Orthodox big O in their pneumatology. They believe in plain English that the spirit proceeds from the father alone, right? And there's then this belief that, well, Western fathers believe in the filioque, that the spirit proceeds from the father and the son. What often gets lost in these discussions is, are we talking about eternal procession, which in plain English means a procession that pertains to the spirit's eternal origin? Are we talking about a temporal procession, meaning the Spirit's procession to mankind? What are we talking about in these Western Fathers? Are these Western Fathers even saying the things which people say they're saying? And these are all important issues. Indeed. Now, now actually, one of my little bugbears is somehow I was reading another work on um, from a Roman Catholic um, priest on um, discussing the, the um pre prayerification of the mother of God. But the way he was sort of talking about the Byzantine theologians, when he's talking about Gregory um, of Nisa, Gregory the theologian, and I think, well, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> We've got the church fathers and their Eastern and Western fathers, Ambrose, Hillary, um, listen, Leo, the great, and Gregory, they're, they're all fathers of the, the church. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's a problem when you start to talk about orthodox as sort of Eastern rather than being orthodox as keeping the orthodox faith, the, the Catholic faith of which we, which we proclaim to hold. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I have a big problem when they start to, trying to divide that. And, and certainly there are sort of trends which you can sort of see as like, people talk about Antioch and Alexandria, and we can sort of talk about a little bit of certain trends in the West. But um, yeah, especially before you know about the sixth, seventh century, I, I see there's a very much a, a deep commonality in, in what they're talking about and their concepts of the Trinity and things like that. And I think it's a dangerous to start separating them out of East and West too early. I'm not saying that there's not certain things or trends that happen early on, but um, yeah, this this can be a very deceptive thing is orthodox is east or something like that rather than the, the orthodox catholic faith as such and those who put i continue it <laughs> and that the eastern fathers obviously are just as much fathers for the, for the western churches as the western churches are for the eastern eastern um churches as such and and it's good that you brought that up uh usually in the fathers when the word catholic is used it's ironically meant to in its meaning it means orthodox we're talking about right teaching but catholic also has this meaning just as in universal meaning like the universal church we're talking geographically and and all that and so like for example the front of my own parish where i worship on sunday says saint peter and paul 
Orthodox Catholic Church, right? So, and uh, a lot of official statements from Orthodox bishops will say Orthodox Catholic Church, though I think it's better to say Orthodox and Catholic, because otherwise it's sort of a, what's the word, redundancy to say Orthodox Catholic side by side. But <laughs> all that aside, ironically, all that aside, we forget how steeped in both Eastern and Western thought if we're going to say east side of the Mediterranean, west side of the Mediterranean, like it's a rap battle, that a lot of these fathers were. We're going to be talking about St. Hilary Poitier today in more detail after we'll do a little introductory on uh, early Trinitarian thought. Uh, he spent considerable time in the east. He went to a council in Seleucia when he was in exile from the Western Roman Empire. He was fluent in Greek. So Hilary Poitier wasn't like, some guy in some little corner in France that had no idea what was going on in the rest of the Roman world. Like we kind of perceived these sort of medieval distances between East and West that really weren't as relevant in the Roman world. Same with St. Ambrose, right? St. Ambrose is a Western saint, but he was entirely fluent in Greek. He was a like first name terms with Theodosius the Great, the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire. And so he's not someone who's aloof. And many of these Western fathers aren't aloof. We're going into even the seventh century because Rome was still in the Roman Empire at that time. St. Justinian had reconquered them. Um, Eastern, Eastern people, if we're going to say the word Eastern, like St. Maximus spent considerable time in Italy. So it's very important for us Orthodox to be honest and admit when there's differences, but also not make differences when they're not there. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think there's sort of something going on that there's the Roman Catholics and somehow the Orthodox, it's like two separate church traditions or something that grew side by side. That's a real nonsense. <laughs> there is one Catholic tradition, the one Orthodox Catholic tradition that spreads east and west until such stages that particular influence or things that happen in the west from the Orthodox Eastern perspective for for one of it meant that the, the faith became the tradition became corrupted to a certain degree um, that there had to be a separation where we were no longer of one mind but that um, was a, a something that developed somewhere in the West you can see the changes are taking place from the earlier times it's not like it grew up with a separate ideas a separate set of understandings of what the gospel was a certain under, different understandings of tradition its own rules and regulations and and stuff where there were certain parts where there was a um, in custom that they developed it a little bit differently but the, the faith the tradition was the same um, you can clearly see it um, and then it split, but there's sometimes people put back the modern time back on there and, and sort of as if there were two different traditions sort of somehow going on at, at once and sort of slightly influence each other rather than understanding this, the, the one church of the one empire <laughs> spread across of the, the movement of people back and forth, ideas that Greek was predominant in, the, um, in Rome and probably until about the 4th, 5th century when Latin slowly became came into the services. So, yeah, they were speaking the same thing. And anyway, you go to Ireland and you look at the monastic saints of Columba and that, and the experiences that the monk sneaks along to see what's happening with Columba when he goes off to pray and the divine light filling the church. I mean, this is just like a story of a monk sneaking along to watch an Aphanite elder <laughs> going off to pray. The same the same thing you see, it was the same spiritual, the same tradition everywhere at that stage. Though customs sort of became different and then, they sort of sometimes traditions change, unfortunately, over time. But um, yeah, no, and I. But we must never start thinking it's, it's separate things, as you, as you state. That, that we are the one church, one tradition, one idea, and everyone is mixing back and forward. Uh, St. Gregory Great for lot, spent a lot of time in um, Constantinople. Um, there, it, it, it sort of sent from the Church of Rome of old Rome, as such, to Constantinople. Spent some, so they all knew each other, sort of through. So. Now I'm going to read something from St. Hilary, which is going to be kind of like my introduction to the introduction. So we can really contextualize what Hilary says in On the Trinity. And in book six of On the Trinity by St. Hilary Poitier, he says in the uh, 19th paragraph, 
And then when you had breathed into me the breath of life and endowed me with the power of thought, you instructed me in the knowledge of yourself by means of the sacred volumes given us through your servants, Moses and the prophets. From them, I learned your revelation that we must not worship you as a lonely God. For their pages taught me of God, not different from you in nature, but one with you in mysterious unity of substance. I learned that you are God in God, by no mingling or confusion by your very nature, since the divinity which is yourself dwells in him who is from you. But the true doctrine of the perfect birth revealed that thou the indwell and thou the indweller are not one person, that you dwell in him who is from you. And the voice of the evangelists, the apostle, apostles, repeat the lesson. And he continues in verse 21, paragraph 21. These are the men who have taught me the doctrine, speaking of the apostles and the prophets, which I told. And so deeply am I impregnated with their teaching that no antidote can release me from their influence. Forgive me, O God Almighty, my powerlessness to change, my willingness to die in this belief. These propagators have blasphemy, for so they seem to me are a product of these last times, too modern to avail me. Before I have ever heard their names, I put my trust in you had received your generation from you and become yours as still I am. I know that you are omnipotent. I look not that thou should reveal to me the mystery of that ineffable birth, which is secret between yourself and your only begotten. And so why do I say this? St. Hilary of Poitiers uh, was in exile like we were talking about. He was in exile in the Eastern Roman Empire. He's from France, but he's fluent in Greek. He was born in the four, in the actually arguably probably early fourth century. And we could date this because his daughter was also a saint and she died when she was 18 and before he got out of exile. So he could, he has to be only sold when he has a child. And then she died around 360. She was about 20. So that means he was about my subtract 30 years before that. So probably born around 310. If you do the math. And so St. Hilary Poitier was born before Christianity became the state religion Roman Empire. And for those who are curious, Christianity was bigger in the Eastern Roman part of the Roman Empire than the Western Roman Empire. And so even then, it would have been more of a fringe minority religion. There are persecutions all the same. And the time Hillary's writing on the Trinity, the issue is the persecutions are against those who hold to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit being one God in three persons of the same nature, same substance, as he's saying there in that translation, because the word substance would be used in Latin. The reason this is relevant, because one would say, well, why is he just appealing to, tra to tradition? Why is he appealing straight to the apostles and the prophets that they taught that there's not just a soul God, but their one nature. What's he talking about? Why wouldn't he just appeal to Nicaea? Well, one must remember Nicaea was a dispute at this time. Nicaea was in a dispute, and there were several other seemingly church-wide councils held almost every other year at this point, the semi-Aryan councils. And appealing to these, someone else wouldn't be very convincing. Perhaps they weren't, honestly, weren't very convincing to himself. In De Sinatus, even St. Athanasius says that the Council of Nicaea spoke as the words of Scripture. So that's his argument as to why this council stands alone at that time, because there's no other ecumenical councils at that time, was by comparing it to the Scriptures. And obviously the other councils just didn't measure up. So the Scriptures were this bar of pure fidelity to the faith. And it is interesting that St. Hilary Poitier, who is very well learned all over the Roman Empire, fluent in Latin and Greek, that he wouldn't necessarily appeal to earlier fathers, earlier tradition. And so what I'll say very quickly, it's not because he could not. And I think this is where a lot of people get wrong. And this is the wrong episode to speak in extreme detail about Trinitarian doctrine pre-Nicaea. But you had in Jewish thought, like in Philo, he was Philo was essentially a binitarian with a, a middle plate in a streak with emanations, which means in plain English, he believed that the Father, he said the Father is God, and the Word, which we call the Son, is God, and that the Son is a second God. So somehow not 
fully measured up the Father, and that there's an additional emanation called the breath of God or the Holy Spirit. And he essentially had a sort of trinity. Now, there's obvious issues with this, which is we wouldn't accept that as a proto-Orthodox doctrine even. But I say this, if a first century Jew is very learned, is using a kind of trinity, it shouldn't surprise us when the apostles taught the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or God, but otherwise didn't give much more elaboration to the Jewish to the Jewish audiences and the Hellenistic Jews or Greeks converted to Judaism. This would have not been very foreign to them. They were already well aware of the sort of latent Trinitarianism within a Hellenized Judaism, within a Judaism with a middle plate in the spent. And this is something which we are Christians, we believe is providential. It's not by mistake that Plato wrote what he did and Plato's views had evolution as I did. And by the time it's the first century, they were absorbed so much by mainstream Judaism that the audiences were prepared to hear the message of the word made flesh of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being God in three persons. And you'll see in First Clement and Didache, and the scriptures, they will speak the Holy Spirit as God. They will speak the Holy Spirit as a person. He speaks. He's of a personal nature. He's not some impersonal force. But they don't otherwise offer much more explanation. In the second century, and there's more to this, but I'll just stick with the guys who got it right. St. Aristides and St. And I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. And St. Athenagoras, they're both Athenians. Both saints taught that the, each person is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they also taught they're of one nature, which is very interesting. This is precisely the teaching of Nicaea in the second century. And Aristotelius, uh, in, in his case, we actually know he wrote around the year 124 or so because he, he addresses the Emperor Hadrian in the letter. And he actually uses Hadrian's, uh, like, the Roman emperors had like names that were like five, six names long, and he uses like two middle names to address them as well. And so that's how we know this is accurate. It's a very specific eternal detail. And so with even though some scholarship will try to emphasize, I think, a little too much, St. Justin Martyr, St. Theophilus of Antioch, as having views that are too uncompromisingly middle Platonist, the point of the matter is, you already had saints in the second century using the word Trinity, as St. Uh, Theophilus of Antioch does. Speaking of all three persons being God, of being one nature, all the distinctives of Nicaea existed in Aristides case yeah. 60 years after the scriptures were written. Yeah, well, if you don't mind me interrupting here, you right make ahead. A, a good point here. And I think this is, again, a problem of modern scholarship. Um, and a modern thinking, It's a, I, I think it's a humanistic, secular thinking, um, the faith was given once for all, as the scriptures declare by the apostles, and the sense of the the, um, the faith, what it meant, etc., and some of its philosophical language about what it meant was basically yeah was very early, um, and that somebody like Arius comes along. The problem of Arius is he's innovating. It's not like the Trinity is somehow in the fourth century developed as a doctrine and people start clarifying that. No, it's been received as a doctrine. And it, as you these testimonies show that these ideas of a common nature, et cetera, were there from the start. This is what they passed on. Um, and Arius comes up with an innovation. He comes up with something different. And the, the church fathers come back and say, no, <laughs> that, that is innovative. That is, that is not what we've received. That is not our common understanding, the common tradition. And the First Ecumenical Council wasn't a discussion to invent a way to talk about it, but a testimony to what was commonly received by all of this common testimony of the, the Trinity in the one um, uh, obviously, the um, Nicaea, and again, the scriptures were the, the um, not like Protestantism in, the, in a sense, sola scripture, but nevertheless, the scriptures were the written testimony, the authoritative written testimony of the faith. 
um, and they were of a standard against which you tested doctrine because they were the, the, the formal accepted apostolic writings. And um, yeah, and again, also just on top of that is that the idea of the Trinity is right through the Old Testament. Um, it becomes clarified with Christ when he starts to speak and, and, and it's weird, they, they actually, he opens their mind to see it, but it's right through there. And so when the Jews started, the Jews on the Jewish mind start to engage with the um, what Christ was saying, what the apostles say. It, it does come clear. Oh, yeah, they actually know because the, the way the Holy Spirit spoken, all oh, the way the that the word is spoken, etc. In the Old Testament, it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> um, though the emphasis was on one God over and against the pagans of multiple gods, the uh, Trinity is through there, and as you say there are some philosophical backgrounds to the trinity and then platonic thought and actually if you start swinging across to even hindu thought um which involves in the buddhist you start you still see some form of a trinity there and the last little point i'd like to make is that um i think some people say the like platonism and christianity oh like um justin martin's middle platonic or something like that dionysius the era guy was sort of some sort of well I think it's a confusion to understand what Christianity is. <laughs> Christianity has a lot of parallels with it because philosophically, there's when you start talking about the divine, about God, etc., there is a lot of overlap, a lot of language overlap, which is just necessary for the whole topic. Um, doesn't mean that uh, Platonic and uh, Christian Trinity is definitely not <laughs> uh, uh, the Platonic one. It is not the emanations because the Platonic emanations sort of sort of start stepping down towards the diversity of created reality and they flow into it. So you start from the one and you, and you sort of step down a little bit, whereas the Christian Trinity, each is the one, each is completely the, the same. There is no step process, a layering process, which is actually interesting what you start seeing um, it's this later Roman Catholic thought. It starts, this, the way we talk about processions and stuff starts becoming more platonic in the way of its uh, sort of a sort of step down father son and spirit the the, the, the way that they both proceed and stuff like this, this is more like an emanation type of idea which is uh, not like the christian idea um but but there is a lot of um christianity is in a sense philosophically has a lot of parallel <laughs> to and it doesn't mean it's platonic <laughs> and i think people haven't really understood christianity if if they start saying this they haven't seen the way it's really different but at the same time there is a lot of commonality in, in its expression um so i think it's, it's more of a, a lack of understanding christianity than saying that it's platonic <laughs> as such so um Yes, and so which is putting towards some of these writers like Dionysius uh, could be a lot earlier than, than a lot of people say because he still talks about the scriptures as the basis. And I mean, this is really what everybody's talking about until probably well after N Nicaea, um, until Nicaea is, is well and grounded, then you start talking, adding that to the, the authoritative texts of faith. Um, but prior to that, the authoritative writings were the scriptures for everybody, um, though they also recognized and practiced more specifically the unwritten tradition and the way we pray to the East, etc. as Basil the Great and, and um, John the Damascus pull out later on, the way of making the sign of a cross, all these things were passed on in practical terms, but um, it, um, they weren't written down, so they were living this tradition as such, as commonly, um, and, and as expressed in this liturgies. But, um, but the, for doctrine, yeah, the scriptures were the. All right, I didn't hear the the very end because the uh, internet connection. But that aside, it's there's also the issue. That all right, we got three persons, they're one nature, they're God. That's all all settled. The question now becomes, all right, well, what's that exactly mean? And the problem now is, oh wait, the apostles never spelled that out, right? And this is where we get into some issues. So, for example, Tertullian is a thinker who the more I read him, the more overrated I personally find him. 
And in against Praxis, for example, people will extol that book because they look, it's the first book where it uses the word Trinitas, right? And he's arguing in favor of Trinitarianism vis-a-vis um, modalism, for example. I think Praxis was a modalist. And the problem is if you actually read what Tertullian is saying, he's taking where what St. Justin Martyr, what Aristid Aristides, what um, Athenagoras was saying, and he does something really wrong with it. And so essentially... He teaches the Father is, right, they're, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are really one nature, but the Son kind of is a part of that nature, kind of like a pimple kind of coming out of it, and then the Spirit is another part of that same nature, but coming out of the Son. And so they're not really fully God. They're just a part of the divine substance. And we can already see why that's wrong. Now, not to beat up on them, apart from the grace of God, if you just try to use your common sense to understand these things and not divine revelation, not what has been inspired by God's superintendence in the church, like the Nicene Creed, God superintended that creed. So we know that it's infallible. God superintended that for it to say what it says. But Tertullian doesn't have that. He just had his common sense. And so when you try to make some of these things make sense to yourself apart from the grace of God, you get problems like that. And so saints that have also commented on the issue in the third century, like St. Hippolytus, are more vague because he didn't go beyond really what was revealed in apostolic tradition, what was already been established by earlier saints like St. Saint Irenaeus, again, the apologists like we were talking about. And so one then should not be disappointed in Hilary of Poitier that he can't just plant his flag on tradition per se and settle the issue. Because for one, the authority of the church as a structure is something that seems like such a football at the time. It's chaotic for the reasons we just said with the semi-Aryan councils. But two, there wasn't a father because the Aryan controversy did not exist that had clarified the Trinitarian doctrine in terms to counteract the specific Aryan heresy. We've had saints like Irenaeus that counteracted the emanationist heresy, like with the aeons, right? So the very worst excesses of Middle Platonism, which we see in Gnosticism, well, the church responded to that in the second century. So forcefully, there was really no serious response from the Gnostics, even though they still existed for a few centuries later, but no real good intellectual response ultimately. We see with modalism, a lot of the stuff with in the in the monarchist like uh, Paul Sambasada, they had responded to those heresies, but what there wasn't was specifically an Arian heresy, which really was Christ was a, a glorified angel, right? He wasn't a, he was created in time. He wasn't of the same nature as God, and so in some respects, it should have been easier to to dispute. But the problem is because. It was never categorically rejected. This new idea had to be taken on its own merits. And they had, in a worldly way, the upper hand for a few decades in the fourth century. And so here we are now with St. Hilary Poitier, seemingly alone in the woods, alone in exile, with real no good authorities he could appeal to. Maybe because by appealing to him, wouldn't it be convincing? because he's appealing to semi-Aryans and whatnot. What's the one thing they all have in common, the scriptures? But in any event, he appeals to those scriptures, and that's where we have to understand the nature of the arguments he makes about the Holy Trinity. Now, before maybe we start unpacking some of the controversies in uh, St. Hilary Poitiers on the Trinity, do you have any comments on what was just said, Father? Um, I'm just trying to get my <laughs> catch it off in my brain. Um, yeah, well, um, yes. The, I mean, a lot of these times in these arguments, uh, it, we, you are really forced back, the fathers were forced to um, back onto the scriptures as your primary text, I mean, in some ways, uh, because, as you say, it's, it, the, our earlier fathers hadn't addressed the specific points. And so you couldn't sort of pull out specific arguments from them. 
even if you're talking back to Nicaea, if it was just dealing with it afterwards, that itself wasn't yet sort of embedded as the definition of um, risk. So they all, you know, it was there, it become a sort of a, doc, a statement of the, the common faith, but the those who still outside it didn't necessarily take it as an authority as such, as you would sort of 200 years later, it would become the defining authority of being a Catholic Christian as such. Uh, whereas when it's first held, there were still some people who had issues with it. And so you couldn't appeal to it as, per, as, as the uh, rule per se. So if you're talking about the... the the, so you really want to go back, to, and Hilary does. He goes back to the apostolic things, and you can see this in his writings. That when he's when he talks about these matters, a lot of it is just being fake, just repeating the scriptures, just saying what the scriptures says. He doesn't actually very often, I think, push much beyond that. So a lot of the times when he's talking about the Trinity, he's he's quoting the scriptures and sort of leaving it at that, um, without trying to go into too much. Um, definition of it other than using them to support that the trinity as the trinity and, and the equality of each etc um he, he's not going much beyond that to to try to work out some intra-trinitarian ideas or thoughts or how they all relate to each other in sort of a philosophical or a speculative manner um so i think that's how we see his writings Unlike someone like um, St. Augustine, who, who does a lot more of that sort of speculative s s approach to it and um, trying to unpack it. I don't think St. Hilary is doing that. He's just taking what is there and presenting it for his needs, for his particular arguments against the Arians, etc. Now, the way we first started talking about St. Hilary putting in more detail was a passage that troubles me. It troubles me not so much like, oh, no, how about could it be orthodox if it says this? But it troubles me more St. Hilary is an orthodox saint. And I found the passage very hard to square with him having an orthodox pneumatology. And I'm talking about Book 2, Chapter 29. And just out of full disclosure, I'm the dude who argues that St. Augustine's fully orthodox in his pneumatology. So it's it's I'm not even one of those people who think most Western saints are in error on this. It's a passage where me being honest with what it says, I have a lot of difficulties. Now, I've posed this passage to you, and you translated it in the Latin, and you felt it was less problematic. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read. Eh, maybe I'll share a screen. I'm going to share a screen on a translation, and then we could show how it's rendered maybe in a place or two, and maybe we could get into a little nitty-gritty based upon what our memories allow. And let me know, is, uh, does this look visible? I can, I'm going to have to make that bigger, I think. Cool, so yeah. I'm working on that. I think I'm working on that. <laughs> let me see. View. That will do it. There we go. Look at that. That's nice and big. If that doesn't do it, guys, I can't help you. So, oh, no. I lost the share screen, so I'll try again. One second. And so you got to talk when you're doing it live because we don't have Mike Lofton, so we don't have people that know what they're doing. You got me doing this. So that being said, we have this translation of Book 2, Chapter 29. And I'll start with the one that you'll find on newadvent.org, the kind of popular one. And it says this. Concerning the Holy Spirit, St. Hilary says, I ought not to be silent, and yet I have no need to speak still for the sake of those who are in ignorance, I cannot refrain. There's no need to speak because we are bound to confess him, proceeding as he does from father and son. For my own part, I think it was wrong to discuss the question of his existence. He does exist. And as much as he's given, received, retained, he is joined to the father and son in our confession of the faith. It cannot be excluded from a true confession of father and son. Wherefore, since he is and is given and is possessed and is of God, let his Traducers take refuge in silence. When they ask, through whom is he? To what end does he exist? Of what nature is he? We answer that he is through whom all things exist, from whom are all things, and that he is the Spirit of God. God's gift to the faithful. If our answer displeases them, their displeasure must also fall upon the apostles and prophets. 
Now, before we go much further, I'm just going to highlight, and I think it will show, the passage, because it's a little different in the Latin, but the passage that gives trouble, which would be, there's no need to speak because we are bound to confess and proceeding as he does from, the fa from father and son. And so, Father, I'm going to pose this uh, question to you, which would be, is that translation fundamentally accurate, um, or you, would you take issue with how it's rendered? Yeah, I haven't studied that, but I, I, I find that there is a problem with it. It's not actually um, good to the Latin. And the when it's actually translated, his footnotes to why he puts it that way. He thinks it's what the Latin is trying to say. But actually, it isn't what the Latin is trying to say. And it is even, I think, even quite out of context or out of place in that particular um, passage. So, yeah, I, 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 I see the issue. But when I started looking at the Latin behind it, I went, no, he's done a bad job translating that. And it's not, um, it's not, though one could make a case for it from the Latin. That is not a literal translation. It is someone's idea of how to interpret what is said in the Latin. Um, and so and that interpretation seems to have been formed by one who was convinced of a filio quaveth, where he puts it in thinking this is type of an affiliate type, type expression. But um, if you actually take it from Hillary's the rest of the passages, I, I'll go into a bit more detail later. Um, yeah, it's, it's not something, it's not rendered well at all. Would you like me to explain more how I should it should be rendered, or would you like to look it up a bit first, Craig? All right, so Father, I'm going to scroll up to your translation, and the way you translated it was as such that, however, about the Holy Spirit, we ought not to be silent, nor is it necessary to speak. Yet we cannot, by our silence, be the reason they are ignorant. Moreover. There's no need to speak about the point that he is confessed from slash by originators slash authorities, which are father and son. And so you change the turn of phrase from proceed from the father and son. So the word proceeds not there. That's right. In the yeah. Latin, it says actores, that the father and son are the actores to the spirit. Now, actores means authors. And the way you translate it is originators slash authorities. And so I want to see what your view is, the significance of rendering it more literally in the Latin, that he is confessed from originators authorities, which are the father and son. What is the significance of that turn and phrase compared to the paraphrase of the popular translation? Right. Well, in this particular case, um, autoritas, I can't pronounce that very well, can mean author, um, but it also has a sense of um, originator or authority. And Hillary uses it elsewhere as, as authority, the word in its various forms he, he, he uses as authority. And what he means by this is by the authority of the, a, a father or, or God on what they said. So this here, is we're confessing the existence of the Holy Spirit on what authority? On the words of the scriptures, on what the Father says through, through various scriptures in the Old Testament, etc., and for what the Son says when he speaks of the Spirit. So on their authority, on their testimonies we have in the scripture, um, either as the, the, the word of God or the, 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 the statements of the Son, uh, um, we are bound to believe that the spirit is God. And this is what he's talking about. So, and this is what the word authoritas is used here and as he uses it elsewhere. He uses it one stage as the author of existence um, when he's speaking about the son. But I understand this in a broader sense of author of existence, author of all creation, author of all things. And as the father um, and the son is there, not in a specific sense of a um, the 
um, well, generator of the sun for, for that work. But, but in the broader sense of the author of all existence is actually the father of the, the sun. And so that can be read this. But in this particular context and in other places through his works, um, Hillary is using the word as an authority. So this is the authority by which we believe this. This is authority who speaks on this matter. And here in the context, it's very much why do we believe this? Because we, um, as, he, as we've talked about before, he goes back to the scriptures because we see the testimony of the Father and the Son in the scriptures saying that the Son is divine. And that's why we, there's no question about confessing him as such. Um, so I think it flows there. It, it is actually what the Greek Latin says. And I think there's a, the idea of proceeding and stuff is, is actually forced on the text. It doesn't even quite fit the grammar. Um, so because the authorities applies back to the um, not as the um, cause of the, of the son here, but the, the, the authority of our confession, the authority for why we believe this is not the authority of what the of the, the beginning of the spirit as such. It's, it's about our confession. Why do we believe because of the, the authority of a father and a son? So um yeah that's what i've how i've rendered and why now father what what's your phd in if you don't mind me asking um orthodox ecclesiology and did you need a research language for that phd uh no in the end i didn't though so it's sort of one we you do need to be able to get into greek and latin Etc. So we didn't have to formally have a, a course that I could pass a course in those languages. But the reality is, when you're dealing with the fathers, if you can't sort of um, at least for short passages with a dictionary and things, work do translation of um, you know ancient Greek um, and and Latin. It's hard to when you're dealing with a specific saying, a specific text um it, you it's very hard to just talk about it in english because the nuances of the words etc you can get yourself tied up in knots there's, there's many occasions where people start trying to use english texts for uh, the new testament etc and if they're trying to make a specific point on that just from the english you can go way down the track <laughs> way off the track you've you've got to go back and see what the greek greek says so um i've got experience of that and i i, I learned greek liturg liturgically um uh, as well so i could serve the, the liturgy in, in greek and translate so and then i could take across the latin and there's also not only the sort of sense of knowing a language it's there's a skill in actually i'm just trying to get your head around the meaning of a language so quite often, even though you could speak very good Greek or very good Latin, if you haven't got the head in the mind of the fathers, you may not be able to try to comprehend what they're trying to say. But if you've got your head into the tradition of the church, then you can sort of say, oh, yeah, actually, now this is what they're saying. It, it harmonizes with their other fathers. It, it, it comes out. It, it, you can you start to get a, a sense of what they might be trying to say, the, the, the feeling, the, the, the essence, the meaning that comes out. And that's quite important. That's why some translations are difficult. They might have very good language skills, but if they haven't got the, the sense of the fathers, et cetera, that they can really butcher it <laughs> because, because some things are a little bit more difficult. So that's another important part when you're engaging these texts is, is actually having your head in the same mental space as the fathers. And yeah, and that's what's often forgotten is that oftentimes these texts cannot be understood in isolation. And the more one has a well-rounded understanding of the tradition that they were coming from, one can understand and translate them. So for example, you wouldn't want to be someone translating the fathers and have no understanding of the scriptures or specifically old Latin or Vulgate or Septuagint, depending upon what language you're translating. Because you'll immediately identify, oh, they're they're quoting or they're citing or they're referencing such and such. Now, that aside, I did have a Latin PhD scholar also translate the same passage. He concurs with you, but for the audience, I will I'll read the passage in full that he translated. And I will also speak of the parts which 
are somewhat awkward because this Latin could have been corrupted, being that when properly translated, it doesn't fully make sense. And so this is something that, you know, should be kept in mind because, and I might have to reshare screen because it got all black for some reason. The um, something we should keep in mind is there is proof in the manuscript record of forgeries adding the filioque, adding it in margins, things to that effect in particularly a lot of Latin manuscripts. And so there could have been something more here that's been obscured or just copious error that there are Latin words that were slowly kind of morphed into words that don't make sense anymore. But all that aside, let me bring up the passage and read the other translation. Then we'll move on to the rest of the uh, of the book. Huh. There it is. Wait, where are you? Don't know what it's doing. It's disappearing on my screen. And I guess uh, I'll just try sharing screen. It's going to look really funny. All right. There we go. Share. All right. See how it's like that crazy thing here? All right. Now, the Father, do you see the other translation now? Yep. All right. So <laughs> this is our work around. So anyway, the anonymous Latin PhD translates the passage, passage as such. But we should not be silent about the Holy Spirit, nor is it necessary to speak, but it is not possible for us to be silent for the sake of those who do not know. But it is not necessary to speak about him who must be confessed since the Father and the Son are reporters. So he translates actores or however or actores or whatever it is out of the Latin in front of me as reporters. And indeed, I think that we ought not to discuss whether he exists, for he does exist. When the giver of the spirit is accepted, the spirit is met with. And so it's going to say, what's Hillary getting at here? The debate is whether the spirit is a person. And he says, well, no, the father and son says he exists. He is a person. So th this is the issue that he's arguing with Arians about. Because it would be Arians that say the father is God, the son is of the similar essence as God, and the spirit is something else entirely. And he's saying no. So let's continue. And he who has joined by the confession of the father and the son cannot be separated from the confession of the father and son, meaning the baptismal formula. We baptize in the father, and son, Holy Spirit right? So we can't separate the spirit from the others who are confessed. So we kind of see now the context of the father and son are reporters about the spirit. Let's continue. Therefore, since he is, that being the spirit, he is, and is considered to be the giver and of God, let the speech of culminator, father, you're English, you can pronounce words. Illuminators. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cease from this point. When they say through whom he is and on account of what he exists or of what sort he is, if our reply displeases them, when we say through whom are all things, from whom are all things, and because the Spirit is the gift of God for those who have faith, then the apostles and prophets will also displease them. So he quotes a couple of scriptures and he says, if these don't serve as evidence that the Spirit is also God, then your issues with the apostles and prophets, not with me. So that is St. Hilary de Poitiers' point. But as we could see, this more literal rendering of the Latin really draws out what the passage is about. And it's not about the eternal origins of the Spirit, specifically. It's not about the Father and Son being authors of the Spirit in the sense of originators. But rather, they're the authorities or reporters that testify to his existence. Just like when Christ says, you know, I have two, three witnesses, and then he names himself amongst those witnesses. So this is a kind of similar rationale that St. Hilary Poitier is pointing out. Well, now, Father, being that you've also looked at this passage in Latin, do you have any quibbles you'd like to take or any comments otherwise on this rendering or anything we just talked about? Um, well, the reporters is another way of interpreting um, the uh, the, the, the Latin word by Octoratus, I, <laughs> Oct uh, I can't pronounce it very well, Octoros. Um, but um, I, I would actually favor authority because in other passages, um, it, it, he uses the word that tends to take that sense. Reporters is a little bit not very Latin, there's not very much of that age that he would be speaking of an authority. We believe it because the Father and Son said it. 
therefore standing them up as an authority as we would be probably a better way in english to carry the meaning which is meaning which is using there rather than reporters um they're not just simply reporting it as a, as a journalist for example but they stand as authorities obviously because our god <laughs> um when they speak so it's a sense of reporting but the sense of authority i think um, as we would use it, you know, he's an authority on that matter, is, is probably a better sense of uh, which it, the word does carry um, for that. But apart from that, he's saying that the, the, what I, as the same thing as I've been seeing in it, and um, and, and that carries a sense which for the rest of that passage it, that he's God because, um, and that's what the, the focus of the, the paragraph is. It's nothing to do with trying to talk about the processions of the begetting of the son of the procession of the spirit that, that's out of context here um so yes he, he's basically done the same thing as i've done the only quibble is that i think the word report is probably a little weak in that point but um yeah i, I can't see that being a sort of um unfaithful to the latter now i'm going to read a couple passages which i think are relevant and because they speak of the father being the author of the son. So, for example, book four, paragraph 35. And this is, and just so people know, I could have easily never mentioned these and, and introduced no difficulties into the interpretation of this text, but I'd like to think that all of us love the truth and we're willing to grapple with some of these difficulties. So, anywho, book four, paragraph 35, St. Hilary writes, the distinction of persons is indicated by you and your, but nothing suggests a difference of nature. Your points to the author, you to him who is the author's offspring, for he is God from God, as these same words of the prophet declare, God, your God, has anointed you. Right? So that's the you and your that he's talking about. That's the passage, uh, Psalm 110. And his own words bear witness that there is no God interior to God the unoriginate. So now we see what he means by author, that this is in reference author equals unoriginate God. Now, if I were a Roman Catholic apologist, Father, I would say, well, Father, it sounds to me that the word, the way the word author is being used is very specific. It's speaking of the unoriginate God. And so perhaps in Chap book two, chapter 29, when he says that both the Father and the Son are authors, that he's speaking of them as originators, which is a legitimate rendering of the word author in Latin. I mean, to think about it, right? The author is the originator of the book, of any book. And so I'll read another passage that's really to the same effect. Book five, paragraph 37. He is God, yet by the powers of his nature, God is also in him. And because he is God and God is in him, there's no God beside him. For God, than whom there's no other source of deity, is in him. And consequently, there is within him not only his own existence, but the author of that existence. So we could see the word author is also being used as source. Again, originator. So, Father, what are your response to be to the fact that we do have evidence of St. Hilary Pordé using the word author very specifically to mean originator. Well, you can use that um, word to, to mean that. Um, and so, yes, it does raise a sort of um, a question as whether he's using that to mean that in the, the, the particular passage of um book two um section or chapter 20 29 um but again the use of author in those two passages which you brought out could be a much wider sense of author as the father is the the creator of all things now not to use it in the in terms of son as a creator of the son but but just simply as the use and of um, a term. Now, this actually just brings up another point, which I just I'll tell you something else reminds me. Quite often, I think in the West and and in these discussions, there can be use of a word which has a specific meaning, such as the father of um, son, meaning he's begotten out of a father. 
but sometimes we can use the word God um, is God of God, etc. Not meaning that he's somehow the God of God, <laughs> that that therefore the Son is somehow less God than 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 God, but we we are using the name of God in this case as we understand God from our perspective. It's an identity name, so we're talking about God uh, for humans. We're not talking about God as a God relative to as far relative to the son as if the son is not god <laughs> um so but we still talk of a god begetting his son and we say god of god sort of thing um but that's because we identify from a human perspective so when you talk about author of existence we can also be using that label for the father in the principal sense of the um creator the beginner of all and to identify who we're talking about is the author of existence and then his son coming out without reducing the word author there to simply being equivalent to father of the son because we're using it as an identifier from our perspective who we're talking about and this is i think is quite often used in the west when they're talking about the spirit if they do be from the father and the son they are talking about it as an identifier of the spirit from our perspective so who is the spirit he's the one that is sent from the father and the son to us so they, they, they refer to him as from father and son, as from our perspective of considering him, not necessarily from an eternal perspective of how the father and the son originated, etc. It's just simply an identifier of, so we know who, we, who we're talking about from our perspective. So the, the word author in here can be taken in that way without necessarily reducing it to be the way that the father is cause of son and spirit and in, in that narrow context um yes he is also the, the cause of both um but it, it doesn't necessarily be tying into um <laughs> it just doesn't mean necessarily just that as father now having said that in the context as we talked about of the passage um the word doesn't quite work so well because the grammar doesn't quite work so well and he also uses that word octor in its various forms to mean the author or the authorities so in book five section chapter two book five chapter section five um and actually quite a number of places if you go for a word search for this he uses it in the way of an authority that, that we look, we follow this by this authority, that authority. So he uses it in a number of ways. And so we can't just simply say, oh, he used it here in this passage, therefore we must use it there in that one. We have to actually go into a little bit more in depth. What sense is he using it in this and what sense is he using it in that? And is he using it solely for the specific sense of cause of the other persons of the Trinity? No, well, it doesn't really mean that. And he's, he's using, uh, we can see that in a wider sense in this passage you're talking about. And in fact, he uses the same word for, in different contexts and other things. So when you come back to book chapter, book two, um, chapter 29, um, we've already discussed the passage where he's trying to sort of talk about the proof that the Spirit is God, is one of the Trinity. Well, we've got the authority of the Father and the Son uh, already, in the, as declared in the Scriptures, and all the rest. So we don't need to confess this because they've confessed it in the in the Scriptures. We can we can go look through the Scriptures, and that carries a natural sense of what he's saying in the passage. Where to go off into sort of saying, or oh, that they are the causes of it, or what's that relevant to believing the confessing as such, or why and also, the grammar doesn't quite work as well um, for that. It, it, it's more the grammar fits better with them being the, the authorities of the confession rather than them being the authorities or, or originators of the spirit um, as, as epistasis. So, um, yes, there's a prima facie case. Okay, so yes, I can get excited about it. Yes, I can make an argument for it. But the argument, if we're trying to take it as a proof text that is going to that's going to overturn the orthodox perspective as a as a as an authority says the orthodox perspective must be wrong because hillary says this it doesn't stand up because very legitimately and then probably better it can be read quite consistently with the rest of his works 
without having to imply anything of any meaning that he proceeds from the father and son, or that he's the the, the father and son are together originators of the spirit, um, which is quite out of context and quite out of character for what he says elsewhere. So I think the the, the, the at least you can say is that there is a legitimate other sense, and I and I think even better than that that the overall sense and this other latin scholar basically um reinforces that um that this in that particular context it means a, a reporter of authority the source of where we get our confession not the source of the spirit as an epistasis and father i appreciate you really drawing that out and showing that also from the writings of uh of saint hilary poitier and we'll read one last section of On the Trinity, and uh, I'll give people the opportunity to start asking their questions if they have any. And uh, we will, uh, what do they call it? Move on to that last passage. And so let me start reading it. And it's in book eight, which is really the book about the Holy Spirit. Just like in book nine, is a very important book. It's about the economic conversation of the of the Lord voluntarily assuming passions and death. That's what the whole book is about. Well, book eight, it's about the Holy Spirit. So you really can't understand his doctrine, the Holy Spirit, without reading book eight. And it's really the only book that really talks about the Holy Spirit in any real detail. So we'll start with paragraph 19. And he says, St. Hilary, Moreover, let them listen to the testimony of the Son as touching the unity of nature between himself and the Father. For he says, when the Advocate has come, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. So we can see it's about the temporal procession because this is what's being referenced. The Advocate shall come and the Son shall send him from the Father, and he is the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father. He who sends manifests his power in that which he sends. But as to that which he sends from the Father, how shall we regard it as received or sent forth or begotten? For his words that he will send from the Father must imply one or other, the other, of these modes of sending. And he will send from the Father that spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father. He therefore cannot be the recipient since he is revealed as the sender. It only remains to make sure of our conviction on the point whether we are to believe an egress, i.e. it's begotten of a coexistent being, or a procession of a being begotten, meaning he sent. And so just in plain English for those following al along, St. Hilary is saying that the fact that the Spirit temporally proceeds from the Father and the Son, or through the Son, or as we'll see what St. Hilary will say, by the Son, this temporal procession shows the sons of the same nature as the father. So this, this is his apologetic point. Now I'll continue with paragraph 20. For the present, for the present, I forbear to expose there, the Arians, license of speculation, some of them holding that the paraclete spirit comes from the father or from the son, for our Lord has not left this in uncertainty. So what has he not left uncertain? For after the, the same words, he spoke thus. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak from himself, but whatever things he shall hear, these shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you. All things whatsoever the Father has are mine. Therefore, said I, he shall receive of mine, and shall declare it unto you. And so what St. Hilary say, says is the significance of this. Accordingly, he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, he the Spirit receives from the Son, who is both sent, proceeds by him, and proceeds from the Father. Now I ask whether to receive from the Son is the same thing as to proceed from the Father, but if one believes there is a difference between receiving from the Son and proceeding from the Father, surely to receive from the Son and to receive from the Father will be regarded as one and the same thing, all right, concerning the temporal procession. For our Lord himself says, because he shall receive of mine and shall declare it unto you, all things whatsoever the Father has are mine. Therefore, said I, you shall receive of mine and shall declare it unto you. That which you'll receive 
whether it will be power or excellence or teaching, the son has said, must be received from him. And again, he indicates that this same thing must be received from the father. For when he says that all things whatsoever the father has are his, and that for this cause he declared that it must be received from his own, he teaches also that what is received from the father is yet received from himself, because all things that the father has are his. Such a unity admits no difference, nor does it make any difference from whom that is received, which given by the father is described as given by the son. Is a mere unity of will brought forward here also? All things which the Father has are the Son's, and all things which the Son has are the Father's. For he himself says, And all mine are yours, and yours are mine. It is not yet the place to show why he spoke thus, for he shall receive of mine. For this points to some subsequent time when it is revealed that he shall receive. Now at any rate, he says that he will receive of himself, because all things that the Father had were his. To sever, if you can, the unity of the nature and introduce some necessary unlikeness through which the Son may not exist in unity of nature. For the Spirit of truth proceeds from the Father and is sent from the Father by the Son. All things that the Father has are the Son's. And for this cause, whatever he who is to be sent shall receive, he shall receive from the Son, because all things the Father has are the Son's. The nature in all respects maintains its law. And because both are one, that same Godhead is signified as existing in both the generation and activity, since the Son affirms that which the Spirit of truth shall receive from the Father is given to by is is to be given by Himself. So the frowardness of heretics must not be allowed an unchecked license of impious beliefs, in refusing to acknowledge that this saying of the Lord that because all things which the Father has are His, therefore the Spirit of truth shall receive of Him is to be referred to unity of nature. I ask now, he says in paragraph 26, therefore, how can they fail to be of one nature? The spirit of truth proceeds from the Father. He is sent by the Son and receives from the Son. So, Father, that's a mouthful, but that is the whole doctrine of the Holy Spirit from St. Hilary of Poitiers. In book nine, as book eight, as much as I can condense it. So I'm going to ask you a question, plain uh, devil's advocate, which would be, are we being eisegetical by saying he's be speaking merely of the temporal procession? He keeps repeating everything the Father has, the Son has by nature. So why would that not include the procession of the Holy Spirit eternally? Right, well, in this text, um, he's basically very careful to talk about proceeds from the Father and sent by the Son. So he never talks about proceeds from the Father and the Son. As one is proceeds from the Father and sent by the Son. He's staying very faithful to the to this scriptural text here. Um, now, this is the case when it's talking about sent by the Son. He is talking about sent to us. So the, so the context of this sending is the sending to the faithful sending to humanity and he does make a careful distinction between proceeding from the father and is sent by the or sent from the father by the son so so he i think he's here and this is a very orthodox in a sense that the procession is from the father alone he never speaks of it coming from the father and the son but just from the father so he proceeds from the father the son then sends it to us so we've got the sense of that. And so we're even below, when it talks about he, he's not the recipient, he's talking about the sending. Obviously, when the son sends it to us, this is a temporal thing. The son's not receiving it um, in that temporal manner. It's been given to us. It's been sent to us. The only quibble I have with this particular passage is the sense of reception where he talks about the Son, um, the Spirit receiving from the Son. Um, now, he's doing that to talk about the common nature and from what we receive from the Father or Son. Of course, we're receiving the one and the same Spirit, whether it's from the Father or Son, from Father through by, by the Son, etc. We're even receiving one. and There's no difference whether we receive from the Father or the Son in the sense the Spirit we're receiving is of a common nature as, as both. But if you look at the scriptural um, text carefully, 
it says, receive of what is mine. And then immediately it talks about whatever is mine is from the Father, is the Father's. So the text is saying that the Spirit has everything that the Son has. Um, he receives from the same source as the Son. So he is, when we receive the Spirit, we lose nothing of what is the Son's because the Spirit himself is from the same source and has whatever the, 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 the Father has and receives everything that Christ receives. And this is why it sort of said, as he makes it fine, everything the Father has is mine. The only meaning for that is that the Spirit is sourced from the Father and receives everything from the Father and therefore receives everything that the Son has, has exactly what the Son has. And this is to encourage the disciples that though the Son would be leaving them, the Holy Spirit would provide everything, would, would be no different. They would lose nothing because whatever the Son has, the Spirit has. Um, and this is some strong Chrysostom brings this out a lot better. In the West, I've talked a little bit more about the the, um, the, sun, the spirit received from the sun, but I'm not quite sure. Apart from the fact that I agree utterly with the um, with it being the same nature and everything that Saint Hilary is trying to point out on that, I, I'm not sure if I've worked through quite exactly the, the sort of nuances of what that could later uh, be used um, later on um in, in the way of understanding but i don't think there's anything in hillary there and actually very clearly because he keeps the scriptural language at the father the, the spirit proceeds from the father he doesn't talk about spirits from the father and the son he, it's sent by the son and that's very much a an act of economy so i think the whole passage is building on from the relationship us to it through economy and it's it's not trying to talk about it any sense here of an eternal sending of the sun um and even um, some augustine actually doesn't talk about any eternal sending of the sun he's quite clear to point out that when he's talking about that it's the whole thing is contextualized and us receiving and that the gift and he just makes a whole big chapter about whether the gift the spirit is still gift even if he's not given um and there so even augustine's not really talking about eternal sending from the sun um and so yeah and because he's got this distinction between sent by the son and proceeds from the father i think he, he just dubs us into if into an orthodox there's nothing he's saying that's just not orthodox um in, in the sense of the position that opposed to the filioque saying that the father the spirit proceeds from the father and the son hillary is not saying that and in fact i think it would be quite clear in the way he's keep making that real distinction between the two that he definitely does not want to mean that um and that's not as there's not his purpose he's talking about our relationship to it and the the and how the scriptural text reaffirm the, the divinity of the spirit the equality of the spirit with the father and the son and all their all mutual equality um but he's not going into any speculation on the eternal um procession of the spirit other than just affirming what the scripture says it's from the father um and so yeah there's nothing in there which again it, it, you can try to read a filioque from there but it's, it's not it's just what any other eastern father would say um yeah it's it's interesting because St. Augustine quotes St. Hilary's on the Trinity as, as a traditional authority because uh, by St. Augustine's day, which wasn't long afterwards, probably five decades later, St. Hilary was already one of the most important saints in the West. And uh, Augustine will quote commentaries and stuff from St. Hilary. But St. Augustine seizes upon a similar argument that St. Hilary makes here, which is the fact that let's say father and son could do the same thing here. Send speaks of them sharing the same nature. Now that argument in isolation is not ultra compelling because it would then mean, well, then if the spirit doesn't also send, does he not share the same nature either? It kind of lacks a distinction as to, well, this is true. And as much as there's no sort of hypostatic particular hypostatic contradiction in doing so. Right. And so in St. Augustine's time, he was able to make this distinction, the hypostases being the difference 
the only perceivable difference in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is their relational differences. And that's what is the particular hypostasis of each person. While the doctrine of the particular hypostasis was not fleshed out in St. Hilary's day. So he could say they're persons, but he kind of lacked the, the formal language to really explain it. And this is similar to what we we're talking about, the second century apologist, right? They, they had the same exact doctrine as Hillary. We just read it. Different people, same nature. But because they lacked the clarification from the Cappadocian fathers of the particular hypostases, they could make a point, which in isolation is true, but could be taken the wrong way or could then be used to say something wrong if we, we use it just in isolation. And I think that's why people need to be careful reading The Apologist by saying, oh, they're just middle platonists because we have to understand the limitations of language and certain clarifications weren't made where they couldn't explain something as specifically because the clarification didn't exist. And we kind of see this a little bit in St. Hilary. And so we could read him rightly. And as you point out, it seems to me the simplest explanation is St. Hilary's trying to say there is a difference, but there isn't. There's not a difference in nature, but there is a difference in sending. It's from the Father by the Son is the exact language that we see in the translation here. And so, so much to think about. I think this might be the longest ever stream on Hillary's on the Trinity, focusing on these few passages. So that's got to mean something, Father. You were part of something special. <laughs> So we have a couple questions, if you don't mind uh, answering. One is on St. Hilary of Arles. And if you don't remember, because it's not like we prepare for these random questions, to say, I don't remember. And so do you have anything that comes to mind about St. Hilary of Arles' conflict with St. Leo? And he says, is that the right Hilary? Because I can't remember. But yeah, that's a different Hilary. It is a different Hilary. Um, especially seeing this one died about 100 years <laughs> <laughs> for Leo, <laughs> well, no, well, about fifty years before Leo was born. Um, so Leo was born now in a different century. Um, so, I, but on the specific, um, I, I possibly do have something to say, but I would need to be reminded more on the questions about what specific point. Um, well, he, if I remember right, what, what specific controversy and stuff? Because Hilary of Arles is is a later one, and there, and I I do know about that, but. I, I, I need to know a bit more about what you would want to know about. <laughs> I guess, like he said this, this is in reference to you, since he, that's you as an ecclesiologist, I'd like him to discuss, so St. Hilary went to Rome to tell the Pope to mind his own business would interfere with the Frankish church. All right. Or, um, or, the, or the Gaulish church would probably be the more accurate terminology at that time. Yeah, I mean, well, actually, St. Leo, is, it's interesting, he... he he is patriarch of that, and he does have a general oversight of that. But um, in Orthodox ecclesiology, there are limits to this. So that while the, the um, Pope of Rome, Bishop of Rome, can have a general oversight of all churches, which means that he can write letters to anywhere and say, hey, what are you going on? What are you doing over there? Yeah. But he does so to protect tradition. And so his, a lot of the times he's actually writing to exarchs. Now, exarchs in the church is three major layers of um, bishops. There's the bishop of each city as such. Then they are grouped into synods around a chief city in an area. Now, these are mapped on um, the provinces of a Roman um, empire. And you have a chief metropolis, as they're called, the head city of that. And that's an administrative city. And so the bishop in that city was given the role of being that sort of the, gathered the synod, each synod was gathered around that particular bishop. And they were the ones who ordained the other bishops and had the regular two yearly, twice yearly meetings and stuff. That, that, that was really the, the beating heart of the Episcopal life of the church. Um, and then you have a layer. Um, now, uh, tradition, you have the patriarchs, uh, Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and, and Constantinople are your, are your chief patriarchs. But in between that, especially in the patriarch of Rome and in Constantinople, you have what's called exarchs, which are what was called the Roman diocese. 
where there's a group of provinces. And then one of the bishops of the, that was in the chief city of that would sort of look over those ones. And a lot of times Leah was going to those guys, look, don't interfere with the business of these metropolitans. So your job is to sort of be an oversight. You, you can ordain the, the metropolitan bishops, but not the bishops within there. And, it, and you shouldn't interfere with that. And so perhaps, um, so there is a limit to everyone's jurisdiction. In other words, um, St. Leo the Great couldn't go into a metropolis and ordain a bishop. No, that's the metropolitan's right, only the metropolitan's right. And, and St. Leo is very strong to protect these rights. But St. Hilary, because he's a blur sometimes about these, he might have legitimately gone, well, hey, you're, you're, you're getting in, <laughs> you're telling me off to what my business in here. And we had Leo might have gone, oh, actually, no, you're overexerting yourself in what you're supposed to be doing here. You're actually doing more than you're supposed to. Um, and you're interfering with those. <laughs> this is, that's my job to protect you, them from your interference with them. And so I'm interfering to protect the tradition of the church, not um, to try to interfere per se what you, what you do. Um, so, yeah, and I have to reread exactly the specific thing, but sometimes they're both right. They can both be overextending themselves and, and sort of taking a bit more authority than they should be, but then they also both do have a certain levels of rights and et cetera, where they have a proper authority. And that is always through churches. It, it gets abused or slightly over personalities can affect things, but there's a definite layering of authority and, and, and a limit of those, the scope. And that's what they're arguing about. Um, and who exactly is right on exactly what point, I'm not, I can't remember. <laughs> but, um, yeah. If I remember, St. Hilary Arles ultimately lost, and there was a local council, though the I think Pope Leo was part of it, that, uh, that ruled against him. But I don't know more details. We know later in the ninth century, there's a very similar uh, episode with Hinchmar. And they really are pushing back the idea that the Pope does not need the reception of local bishops. And this goes back to apostolic canon 34. So this would have been the point at issue, but also the fact the way this was resolved with Hilary Varls, if I'm, my memory serves me correct, would show that this was of a conciliar nature, which shows ultimately the apostolic canon would have been followed. Yeah, it's about the limits of his jurisdiction, which were what fell under his jurisdiction. And I think there was some sort of imperial division or something like that. And they had to sort of go, yeah, you do, but we should actually make sure we, we, we distinguish between these two areas. And no, you're not <laughs> to interfere in that particular spot, something like that. So there was a little bit of pushing around. Yeah, where if, exactly if, I were, right if I were to bet money, Hillary of Arles was no longer in the Western Roman Empire at that point. That was probably occupied by this or that German tribe. And so but, but the, church, the church's um, structure transcended the time and space of the empire. It was, it was built, it was found that you used the empire the structure that was there because it made a very handy empire structure to actually replicate the church's um, synods and what it needed to to for unity and to manage things. It was a beautiful structure just sitting there. So they just basically, right, we'll take it. So with no squabbles, we're not going to fight over um, who's got the, the holiest city or I'm the better bishop or whatever. We'll just use the structure that's sitting there, which works very well for church. But when the empire faded, the church just says, we're not going to change our structure. We, we keep the tradition of the, the the bishop who is in that city, even if a city has become ru ruined, <laughs> remains his um the, the head because we don't want to start fighting over things and, and things that we, we've traditionalized it. But there are cases where cities come and go a little bit, and this part of the issue is because the empire starts to decay, that starts creating some of these issues of what was the original city or where, <laughs> where it where it goes. Um, because think the, the actual reality and the map is changing a little bit. So there were some questions and um, just sort of say, right, we want to preserve the tradition, which is this city stays as a metropolitan city, even if that one's been named such. But we share the honor or we will make another little subgroup over here and, and things things like that. So um it, it gets old. Well, there certainly would have been confusion uh, because 
There was also the other point of view that the empires would determine jurisdiction. There's a canon in Trullo about that. And so it could be confusing where your province is no longer in the Roman Empire and it kind of creates sort of a power vacuum. And so it, it could pose an opportunity for a bishop to assert himself more than he should or to be taken advantage of. And this is where a lot of these controversies are taking place. And that's why it's sort of relevant to go, well, it's not like it just happened out of nowhere. You know, there was probably actual a geopolitical background to this dispute, which had to do with the territories under dispute. Now, um, this question, who was responsible for popularizing the Filioque heresy in the West? I've heard it was Charlemagne and the Franks. Also, how much influence did the Franks have over the papacy? Who? Complex question. Um, I do think that the Franks did have a, a particular driving force in this, and it is sometimes the Frankish missionaries which are, are starting to move uh, eastwards, clashing with the, the uh, missionaries from Constantinople, from Thracia, from Thracia and stuff, moving north into the Balkans, and they start to clash. And the um, the papacy, the Rome itself, didn't really embed. It didn't uh, stand out and oppose the use of affiliate clause, but it didn't itself use it until the eleventh century when it actually inserted it into its creed. So I think that a lot of the um, the driving force was the um, the, the Franks. Um, from the ninth century, when Charlemagne is appointed emperor of the empire by the papacy, um, you start getting the, well the same tension he has in the east with power play between emperor and, and patriarchs um, of who takes control. And this is partly, um, or who has more influence. This part personality. This is partly power um, influence. So you can sort of see that going on as well. Rome basically wasn't dominated by the Franks at that stage. Um, it still had too much connection to the empire for that to really happen. But just as a side, I actually think one of the key um, catalysts or, 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 or groundwork to the split, eventual split between East and West was the, uh, making Charlemagne um, emperor by the papacy, because what it did was actually rip the, 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 the unity of the empire, the, 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 co the Christian Commonwealth got divided um, then, uh, two separate spheres, and um, that contributed quite greatly to the eventual ripping apart of the church, because the, the Commonwealth, how it, the church was expressed in the empire and in its society, had a, a fundamental tear in it, because before the two were sort of in a synergy with each other, not to be confused with each other by the times it did, but uh, um, they, they sort of destroyed that by what they did. I can understand partly why they did it, but um, um, that was actually a huge big play. In it. But anyway, yeah, I'm not sure any particular, it's all the personalities, things at different times, at different players, but the Franks certainly did drive the affiliate way and the, a lot of uh, the development of Western thinking um, that they did sort of really become a powerhouse in, in that way. Um, so, and yes, I think if they hadn't been there or hadn't supported it, so, so it may have actually faded out um, without becoming something as large as it did. Now we have one last question, and it's more of a speculative nature. If the Father sends the Holy Spirit to creation through the Son and the procession results in creation, I think that's already a contradiction, then isn't that procession also necessarily an eternal procession since it's before time? I mean, th does this make sense to you, Father? All right, let's have a look again. Um, if the Son sends the Holy Spirit to creation through the Son, if, it, if the procession results in creation, then isn't the procession also in this eternal procession? Um, right now, this is actually something which gets a little bit complex. <laughs> um, 
when we talk about the spirit being sent to creation um well we there's there's multiple layers of this there's initial creation now the relation of creation it is a sense of the creation is the logi of a logos it, it, in a sense the creation is a diversification of the sun into multiple little images and in that eternally the spirit proceeds from the father and through the son and rests in the son when i say through the sun it doesn't proceed in any way apart from the sun we never conceive of a spirit existing separately from the sun it doesn't move in a gap between the father and the son there is no gap but he doesn't move in any way independent of the dyad of a father and the son so in some ways in the trinity we have a father as one we have a dyad of two father and son the spirit's position does not in any way um, override or stand outside the father's son. That's why the father remains eternally father and the son's son, even with respect to the spirit, the spirit of the father and of the son. And it, it sort of binds and distinguishes that union. So when, he, when God creates, he, has, he creates everything through the son. So all the, the, what is created is a sort of little miniature images out of nothing of the, the 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 infinite complete image that is in the sun um and so it's like the creation is like a little suns and when human mankind is like the ultimate image of god and that's why he's called the sun a son of god um but any all of creation we see god through all of it and the spirit naturally r rests through all creation because it is like little sons of god in a sense and the spirit rests on the sun it rests in all the creation that's why the spirit moves over the waters of creation um so we've got a general sense that the spirits through all things as, as the father and the son are through all things and, and the spirit has sort of has a relationship all created things in, in a sense because each one is sort of a miniature particularized partial image of the, the the fullness of the sun now when we're talking about specifically though with a faithful here so when we talk about the, the, the pentecost what we're talking about is the spirit um, given to the faithful now when we're talking about this it's not that the spirit is moving out of the sun to the faithful as exterior to himself they only the spirit only moves the faithful so far as they are united to the sun they are becoming one with him the only need to talk about a movement out of the sun is that the people as the faithful start from a state of separation from the sun and then come bound to the sun and then they're binding to the sun they receive the spirit because they didn't have it before through the sun through the union of the sun but not as separate from the sun so this is why the fathers talk about the spirit only rests in the church it's only in the body of christ it's only in those who are united to christ this is why we receive the spirit after we baptize after we identified with christ this is why the spirit only comes upon the gifts uh, the eucharist once it's identified with christ with the church so that the, the as the offering is that of the church it's the offering is of christ the, the, the offering identifies itself only then the spirit comes in and realizes it as the son and the spirit is ever Abba father it manifests and realizes the son so it always eternally actually proceeds from the father and rests in the son identifying the son distinguishing the son uniting the son and it comes into us because we are united to the son so it doesn't leave that so there's no eternal sense of needing to proceed out because in practice and creation we only talk about the spirit being sent as we are united and becoming truly sons of god ourselves and never apart from the um, being the sons of god so as if we don't have a spirit we're not the son of god um, as it says in the scriptures and the scripture doesn't exist in a specific way of identifying as creating the sun or manifesting the uh, glorifying us <laughs> as or the sun in us um outside the church and so um we do talk about sending but at the same time only in the context of actually that means becoming and resting in the sun and us being united to the sun um so eternally there is no need to talk about a position now, as a matter of fact if you start talking about that you you start corrupting our sense of salvation and what it means because um ultimately um 
to be a son is to receive the have the spirit resting in one. If if a spirit uh, to be son relative to spirit means that you a cause of the spirit, the spirit, then for us we can't be sons of God. It'd be impossible for us to be saved because we would have to be a cause of the spirit. The spirit would have to come out of us for us to be truly sons because that's what it means to be a son by definition of epistasis. But we must epistatically share the same properties as the son. We must be as a son. We must have the one father, our father. We must receive the spirit at, at rest in us as it rests in the son. So we are properly epistatically united with the son, one as, as sort of not the same epistasis as, as eternal one, but we have the same properties. And if we don't, we can't be saved. And this is why the faithful can't give the Holy Spirit. It's only the priests, only from the Father, only by certain authorities are given because it's not natural through the Son per se for the Spirit to come out of the Son. It's something it rests in him, but he gives it as a mediator. Through him, we receive the Spirit. And this is why the priesthood is distinct and the apostles only gave the, the Spirit so that to remember that, uh, that it's not proper to be sons for, for it coming out. So that the filioque in any sort of position is, A, will deny our salvation, could be impossible for us to be sons of God, and B, is not reflected in the traditions of the of the church. And that's exactly why the faithful can't give the spirit as sons of God. Um, it needs priesthood to do that. Now, it's, uh, I feel bad, but uh, John asked the question, and uh, I understand it's late, so if you want to give a quick answer, uh, we have, what does Father say about the Roman Catholic argument that even Eastern Fathers support the Filioque, for example, Maximus the Confessor? Is that a, is that a true uh, assertion made by the Roman Catholic side, Father? Well, the, when someone like Maximus is around, the Filioque as defined at Florence, um, at Lyon, didn't exist as a, as a doctrine. There was no such thing. So we can't say that they were supporting that. What you can say is that they were justifying or giving a reason to allow the talk of proceeding from father and son, which you see in some of the Western fathers. We talk about that and they provide a justification so we don't condemn them. But the only reason they're given the justification is because there is a problem <laughs> with talking about that and they were trying to say well don't take this the wrong way because clearly if you state that in a full bl blunt way as it was later talk, done at leon's and at, at florence it is harris <laughs> this is why he makes a defense of the western fathers because um they weren't saying it in that way but that we, we we understand the, the this not to mean that <laughs> but to mean something of that as i said that identifying sense of it that yes from our perspective we do receive from the father and the son and so when they talk about it the proceeds from the father and son the word is much more of a general sense as coming forth from both as like being sent to us and where yeah, we can speak of that it is a legitimate sense of speaking of that in that terms um and we shouldn't utterly reject that because otherwise we would make a mistake that of the nature of a son is mediator and we have in our union with him and we must receive the spirit through the son and we can't receive it directly from the father because we'd actually mess up our whole trinitarian understanding but the reason why we defend it is because they're trying to make it clear that it doesn't mean what was later held at leon's and florence um, otherwise, they wouldn't have needed to defend it because if everyone believed that, they wouldn't have had this point of actually having to justify anything um, because that would have been the common belief but because it wasn't and it wasn't correct. That's why St. Maximus sort of makes a defense. Why were they saying this? And to give a, a, a real short uh, piggyback answer to the, the question, St. Maximus' letter was read during Florence. The Roman Catholic side heard it. They rejected it, not once, three times. So clearly they did not agree with the doctrine of the Filioque as understood by Maximus, or they would have accepted it, which they did not. They rejected it. And so it's it's an argument that's made in kind of ecumenist circles, but it's just not it's just not fundamentally accurate. I don't know what else you could say. You could you could make fun of the person for being ignorant of this, but it's kind of irrelevant. It's just not true. So what else could one say? So all that aside, Father. Uh, I'm really grateful you came on tonight. Is there any 
anything that the audience should do, the the follow-up um, with your work, your writing, anything, any way they could bless you or any causes you believe in, any plugs you'd like to make? <laughs> um, well, if I happen to live near, nearby and want to attend my parish, I can go along. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, um, there has been somewhere in Norfolk in England, and I'm a very tiny little parish. Um, I'll so keep that in mind. Say free to come along. <laughs> but um, I have a couple of books which I have written on. Well, they're just basically my manuscripts for my master's thesis and my PhD thesis. So I just turned self publishes books. Because <laughs> the, 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 I got, I'd never get any money from it, otherwise. But well, so Father, we, we can work on 30. making you a few bucks. Could you send me the links to those books? I'll put it in the description. So people watching replay will have copies of those books. You could yeah. learn so more about what Father Patrick has learned yeah. without doing any of the hard research because he did it for you. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, one's on the minor clergy of a church, which, which is actually reasonable. It's been translated into Romanian now. Um, it's been translated in Greek, but it's been published in Romania. Um, and the other one is uh, the, my PhD thesis, which is on the hierarchy. It's called The Place of St. Peter in the Ecclesiological, Ecclesiastical Hierarchy. And deals with Dionysius Era Pagait and based a lot on him and goes through St. Leo the Great and Gregory the Great. And, um, basically, the, what I was talking about with um, Hilary of Arles and stuff, were the type of matters I was addressing in that and the whole relationship with the hier all the different layers of hierarchy. Plus also actually how hierarchy works in personal life, the hierarchy of husband and wife, the hierarchy of parents and children, abbot and monks and things like that. It's a, it's a whole principle of how the church is built around these hierarchies um, and our relationships between that um, and draws on how I understand the image of God in, in us. So, yes, if anyone wants to read that, I always appreciate it. And anyone wants to give me some feedback, what they think or critiques, that would be always helpful too. So there you go. It's uh, support Father Patrick, buy his book, and then critique it, say you don't like it after you paid for it. I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, please support Father Patrick. We will have links there in a reasonable period of time. We'll do it when the show is over. And I'll just plug, of course, the churches of Cambodia. You can go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. It's scrolling on the bottom of the screen there. There's wire and instructions to the to the Moscow Patriarchate churches in Phnom Penh, San Oakville, and sort of Simrip. And you could wire money directly, or if you don't want to figure out how to wire money from your bank, or they won't wire money to a communist country, to a Russian church, we could do it via PayPal, which is also at orthodoxchristiantheology.com. So there's donate every single penny goes to the churches in Cambodia. Um, but you don't have to only go there or buy Father Patrick's book. You could... Please pray for us. Take time to calmly and pray for us. God, give us wisdom and humility. May save our souls. Please also pray for the world. It's the Apostles' Fast um, for at least half the church. And it's a good time to pray for the world. That's what my spiritual father keeps telling me. Take time to and money to help support your local monastery, especially during COVID. They lost a lot of pilgrims. For those who have been faithful, I have been keeping the worship alive, please be sure to support them. And uh, point being is this is bless you, bless someone else, and God will bless you in some way. This is not get rich quick scheme. So not saying you're going to get money for it, but God will bless you. You bless someone, God will bless you. So Father, you have any last words or we'll call it an evening? Uh, no, no, nothing. Otherwise, good night <laughs> to the audience out there. Well, good, uh, uh, good evening to the American audience who uh, are still in their twilight yeah, good, zone. <laughs> good middle of the night yeah. for those in England. Good good evening for us in America. Um, good late afternoon for those in California. And good morning for those in Australia. I'll end the like show as I end. That's right. <laughs> I'll end this show as I end all my shows by quoting Jesus Rock, saying, fight to death for the truth. The Lord God will fight for you. God bless you. Have a good evening. <laughs>